from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to today's public forum, and our subject is going to be uh, the issue of illegal drugs, our controlled substance, which of course is a very serious issue and is a very major problem, not only in the United States, but in uh, many parts of the world. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have on our program today an expert who can address this very serious topic. I welcome to the program Wayne Longo, who is with the Idaho Department of Law Enforcement, the State Police. He is in charge of District 1 of the Bureau of Narcotics in our state. And Wayne, we've followed your career a long time, and we know how not only an uh, expert you are on this subject, but how serious you take it. And welcome to the program. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And I'm very pleased to have our two regular panelists uh, again today. Uh, first of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. Uh, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And I shall ask Janelle to commence today's questioning. Well, today I think we're going to be talking not about alcohol and tobacco, but we're going to be talking about those drugs that uh, are illegal in, or uh, controlled substances, the ones we think of in that category, and so that our viewers can better understand what we're talking about. How do you define those kinds of drugs, and how are they produced? Uh, do they grow on bushes, or do they come in the laboratory, and, and okay. can you get, identify some of the major ones sure. that we're talking about? Um, well, first, I guess to answer the first part of your question, uh, the state legislature enacts laws that when they deem a drug to be uh, dangerous or subject to trafficking or whatever, dangerous to human health or whatever, they in turn will establish penalties and, and put it into the Controlled Substances Act. Um, and that's the law that um, uh, my unit is primarily enforcing uh, in the state. Uh, as far as the drugs that we see in North Idaho in my district, and pretty much it's the same throughout Idaho, um, uh, we see drugs like marijuana, cocaine, methamphetamine, some crack cocaine, and on slowly on the rise again, LSD. And to answer your question about how the drugs are produced, um, we range from drugs such as marijuana that are obviously grown, uh, it's a plant, uh, and then it's dried, smoked, uh, and what have you, uh, to a drug in between, cocaine, that also starts out as a naturally occurring, in a naturally occurring state as the coca bush. Uh, that is in turn uh, transformed into coca paste in a, in, a, in a laboratory and then produced into cocaine hydrochloride and another chemical process again in a clandestine laboratory to get into the powder form of cocaine that we're used to seeing in the streets of the United States uh, as that we know as cocaine. Uh, so there's two processes in, in that particular drug to the drugs uh, that we deem to be extremely dangerous uh, as well as some of the others as methamphetamine and LSD which are produced entirely in clandestine laboratories uh, and that's kind of a, a, a dual problem in that the the manufacturing process itsel itself is extremely dangerous and hazard as is the drug that's finally produced. Um, the chemicals that are used for producing both methamphetamine in LSD, a lot of the chemicals are extremely toxic, uh, known carcinogens, highly volatile, uh, very dangerous um, to handle, let alone to combine in a laboratory setting. Um, so I, I think hopefully that answers your questions on where the drugs are produced. The kind of production. Now, some of those drugs, of course, are, are brought into the area. Mm -hmm. um, how many, or, or I don't want to say how many uh, actually, but what kinds of drugs would be produced right here? Uh, as opposed to those who come across borders. So in other words, my question really has to do with trafficking. Sure. Uh, is, is it something that moves back and forth between uh, states and, and countries even? Actually both. Um, <clears throat> again, speaking for Idaho as an example, um, we produce or grow um, quite a bit of marijuana within our own state, uh, both outdoors and in indoor uh, operation, grow operations inside. In fact, up until a few years ago, um, and it was marijuana that was seized up in North Idaho, we held the record for the highest concentration of THC in a marijuana plant, and it was seized uh, in a county in my district. And uh, as part of my responsibilities, I have to send samples to the federal government so they can analyze it, they take trends, they see how, uh, how the production methods in marijuana production is increasing and, how, and therefore how 
the purity level of, of THC is increasing, and at that point it was 19.3 percent. Um, we've since hit the 25 percent bracket in this country um, with marijuana, but uh, for a while there we had the highest concentrations in the nation. Uh, so we produce a lot of our own in this country as well as in Idaho, and that has le it's, it's lessened our dependence, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, on importation from other source countries, whether it be Latin America, Mexico, or other countries. Um, and the same thing with a lot of the other drugs. Cocaine, for example, um, is entirely imported from out of this country. We do not produce any cocaine uh, hydrochloride in this country. Um, we know the coca plant grows in just a very small area of uh, South America, very few countries, and it can't be reproduced in our, in our own country. So whatever form it comes into the United States as, whether it says coca paste or cocaine hydrochloride, the finished product, we're importing it into this country. Um, the other drugs, for example, though we entirely produce within our own country, methamphetamine, I guess is one of the best examples. Um, we produce that entirely with our own chemicals. Um, we have laboratories. Uh, we have seize laboratories within this state, within my district, um, and within this part of the United States. And so that is a drug that is entirely an American drug, um, where we're now exporting um, to other countries. Uh, LSD, again, is another drug that we produce entirely in this country. So we have a little bit of all of them. Uh, we're import importing some, uh, producing our own, and some that we are uh, making our own, we're also importing, such as marijuana. Steve Sheen. Wayne, I've got some questions in mind that I hope will give some perspective to the drug problem in, in the country. And if I'm, I know, I know you're you're a state police officer. Yes. Are you comfortable talking about national issues sure. in general? C could you give us an idea in terms of dollars how big the drug industry, if we can call it that, is in, in the United States? Um, I don't have any exact <coughs> figures. It would, I think, would be safe to say in the billions of dollars as far as uh, as money changes hands from. Uh, from the street level consumer on up as it goes through the food chain to the highest level trafficker, I think would be safe. We're talking in the billions of dollars. Again, and if, if you're not comfortable talking about national statistics, uh, put it on the state level for sure. us in Idaho, but, but what about uh, uh, drug trafficking as a percentage of crime convictions? If we looked at, at, at uh, federal and state prisons around the country, Roughly how many uh, of the inmates in those facilities are going to be there because of drug violations? Again, I don't have the exact percentages, but I think a, a fair amount of people that um, go into our uh, criminal justice system, if they're not going into the system itself for drug trafficking or drug abuse problems or, or drug-related crimes, um, a good percentage of those individuals are under the influence at the time that they commit a crime. I've seen some studies done in the Midwest and Chicago where over 50% of criminal felons being brought in for crimes ranging anywhere from street muggings on up to some of the more serious crimes, rapes, murders, things like that, are under the influence of some illegal substance, whether it be cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, or whatever. Uh, interestingly enough, as the seriousness of the crime or the violence of the crime goes up, we see the, the drugs typically that are showing up, um, usually coming back to the drugs that we know can help produce some very violent behavior in, in individuals, and that's usually methamphetamine or cocaine abuse. And I've, and I've got a final question that's that's um, uh, somewhat related, uh, but I'm now thinking about trends. From from your view as a, as a working officer, do, do you see, and, and I'll preface that by saying that we read so much today about, about violent crime in this country, but there are actually some statistics that suggest that violent crime uh, per 100,000 population it has declined a little bit, but I think the reporting of it is, is, uh, has gone up. What, what do you see in terms of drug offenses? Is it, is, it, uh, is it trend up or down or steady? Speaking from what my unit tries to focus on, the major level traffickers, I really don't see much of a let up. Um, we're busier than ever I've seen it uh, in my career with the department. Uh, I've been uh, in my present position as uh, supervisor for the drug unit for the state police for a little bit over, over 10 years, and I've never seen it this busy. Um, again, looking at it from our perspective as far as major traffickers, I do think, and, and this may sound contradictory, I, I do think that we're having an effect. I, I think, if nothing else, from as we do our criminal investigations, we, we know that we're creating a tremendous amount of paranoia out on the street, and we do know that some people are choosing not to stay here. Um, if they, they come here and they're arrested by us, they uh, we are seeing some people leave the area, or if they, if so, for some reason they, they think we're coming close to them, 
people are leaving. So I think aggressive law enforcement, whether it be from my department or the sheriff's office or the city police departments, I think it ha is having an effect. And it's hard to see it from a street perspective, from a citizen point of view, because it's hard to tell somebody that crime is going down or we've got a handle on crime when somebody just stole their VCR mm -hmm. um, or they've had their house burglarized. It's really hard to talk statistics to those folks. Um, they, they're worried about their crime and as they should be. But I, I do think we are having somewhat of an effect on it. Wayne, you, know, you have so many areas that you <coughs> have delved into concerning uh, the problem of drugs. And some of the ones that you've identified today, like cocaine, have been around a very long time, and our viewers are more familiar with that problem. But uh, are there trends, to, uh, particularly with young people, that they're experimenting with new areas? What are the new dangers, uh, dangerous trends? In, in that's a good question. Um, one of the, it's a very disturbing trend. Um, we're seeing a tremendous amount of methamphetamine use, um, and methamphetamine is a very powerful central nervous system stimulant, similar in some degree to effects of cocaine, but um, different in, in some others. And um, we really don't know why. Uh, Cost-wise, it seems to be very evenly balanced between what it costs for methamphetamine and what it costs for cocaine. And so we don't really know if there's uh, any kind of uh, what really is going on in people's minds, why we see so much of a trend towards methamphetamine. And it's not just Coeur d'Alene, it's not just Kootenai County, it's, um, it's, and it's not just Idaho, it's throughout the entire nation at this point. And I've talked to my counterparts in other states and, and my, other, my peers around the state, and we don't know why. But in some areas of, uh, of Idaho, we're, we're almost seeing cocaine disappearing and methamphetamine replacing it. And part of the reason it's so disturbing is typically methamphetamine is injected. It can be uh, snorted like cocaine hydrochloride, but a tremendous amount of the users, uh, no matter what the age, we see uh, injecting uh, cocaine, or methamphetamine, excuse me. And the obvious problems and the stigma that goes along with somebody using hypodermic needles and the health problems, you know, the list can go on and on. But certainly if you're talking about young people, um, delving into this area of drug abuse, it, it, it's alarming if for no other reason from, you know, what is happening to our, some of our youth that are choosing to do this type of a drug. You know, you really opened another can of worms. Not only <clears throat> are the drugs, so uh, many of them, so destructive physically, or, and number two, that a lot of people who are addicts uh, commit crimes to get the money for the drugs, but also with the use of needles and so forth, you get into the problem of AIDS and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this it's just such a wide umbrella of, <coughs> of problems. Oh, it certainly mind. is. And I, I guess, the, again, to show you what departments deemed as, as far as a, a threat level to us, and I, I, I never thought we'd, we'd see this day come, but several years ago, uh, our department policy changed. So we were all inoculated for hepatitis B simply because of the, um, the, the more uh, uh, intravenous drug users that we're seeing. And it's a threat level that we face as well as what a user faces. I mean, it, it hits everybody all the way around. Uh, law enforcement, uh, jail facilities, if somebody has to go into the emergency room, um, a user's family, and the user themselves, obviously. But it, it's not just somebody being able to say, well, it's my body, I'm only affecting me. Mm -hmm. um, the chances are you could be hurting someone else or it affects someone else as well. If the panel will bear with me, I have just one more question and I'll return to them. Uh, and that has to do with uh, some more specifics on what some of these drugs uh, do to human beings. I'm, I'm thinking of LSD where uh, some people have hallucinated and they've mm -hmm. jumped out of buildings that they were birds. Give the viewers some description of the what you've seen as consequences of the use of certain drugs. Okay, well LSD, I guess to, um, since we uh, on that particular drug, um, is, is a hallucinogen and people that do abuse LSD are going to hallucinate and the degree or the severity is going to depend on a lot of things, uh, how strong the drug is, how much of a dose that they got. And, I, and it's hard to uh, talk about some of the dangers without going into, we don't have rocket scientists producing these drugs. We're not talking, mm -hmm. when we talk about laboratories, we're not talking about a facility such as NICs where you have a very pristine environment, pure chemicals, and the people working in those laboratories know when they pick up a bottle of a particular chemical, that's what the label says is what it is. We're talking about people that produce these drugs, LSD and methamphetamine, I'll, I'll lump together, I guess, to, to put the dangers together, um, where they're, they talk about recipes that are handed down, they change them. Uh, a lot of the chemicals that are used to manufacture these drugs are illegal in themselves, so they're very difficult to obtain. And so um, when they can't get a particular chemical, maybe they substitute something else. Um, methamphetamine, for example, uh, a very common 
ingredient used in methamphetamine production as a base to alter the pH of the, of the substance is red devil lye or Drano. Um, if you can imagine putting that into your system, none of us would think about doing that. But if I had brought a list and showed you the list of chemicals in methamphetamine, all of them on a toxic EPA cleanup list, um, you know, would be amazed that people would even want to put this stuff into their system. Yet we see a tremendous, tremendous amount of it out there. That's probably the biggest danger is you, you don't know what you're getting in your system. You can't control the purity. You can't control the dose. LSD, again, to go back to that, um, is, in, is a clear odorless liquid, the drug itself. So to put it into a medium where somebody ingests it, it's usually on a piece of paper called blotter acid. Um, and this is for parents that maybe have, are listening to what maybe they're, uh, somebody that they suspect is using drugs. If they hear these types of terms, talking about blot or, or acid or trips and things like that, it's a key to maybe listen up a little bit more. But the, the, the acid, the paper itself would fit on the size of your um, small nail on your, on your finger. Um, and it's a very, very tiny, but the dosage from the LSD itself, um, a thousand people could get high on the, on the amount of LSD that would fit on the head of a pin. So it's a very concentrated substance. So therefore, when it's manufactured and fit into the lab setting, we don't know, for, for instance, what one piece of blotter paper might have, how much LSD is on that, as opposed to another one and another one and another one. Maybe there is two doses on one hit of paper, and there's none on the other. So somebody takes the one with nothing on there. They don't get the trip that they want. So they take another piece of paper, and there's two doses on there. And then you start getting into the overdose factor. So the purity level is probably the biggest danger. Um, you don't know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And it's um, there's just uh, it, it, it is just an unknown that you just can't control. No matter what a street dealer tells you that this is 50% pure cocaine or 80% pure, nobody can assure you of that except a certified lab. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the biggest danger is just not knowing what you're ingesting. Mm -hmm. Janelle Berg. Well, I want to follow up on what Tony was just asking and go a little bit further. How do you identify behaviors that might be associated with drug use? One of the biggest things that I think parents or anybody really needs to be aware of if they're worried about somebody that they know might be using drugs is mood changes, um, changes in personality. Um, people that have an interest, interest for an example, in a hobby or a sport or something, and then all of a sudden they lose it for no reason. Um, um, loss in productivity at a job or in school. Somebody that's an honor student one semester goes down to a C or D student the next. Not that that's bad that they're a C or D student, but when you see that rapid change and there's no real rhyme or reason why that happens, it's, it, it's not always drug abuse, but it should urge a parent to maybe delve into it a little bit further and ask questions. And that's one of the things I would strongly suggest people do. Don't wait until the behavior becomes so bad that it hits you in your face and say, this has got to be drug abuse, because unfortunately, sometimes it may be too late at that point. As a parent myself, I would rather ask a question and doing it, doing it in a controlled setting if you have any um, suspicions or concerns, because it's your child. And if you don't ask, then who's going to ask? Um, I can't, as a police officer, you know, our hands are full. Um, and I think as we, and again, it, it just keeps revolving around. If we can get, stop our children from using these things, then years down the road, I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop this drug abuse problem or at least have a good grip on it. So hopefully I, I've answered part of it anyway. Yes, you have. And, and what about paraphernalia? What are people, what should good people question. be looking for when Again, they Again, it varies on the type of drug. Um, LSD, um, for example, there's very little in paraphernalia use that you're going to see. Uh, the best thing to do is to look for the signs that your the child's behavior is changing. You really have no concrete information as to what else it might possibly be. The things to look for with LSD are, um, again, the blot of paper. And um, it's very, very tiny. Usually it's in a uh, particular design that is popular with our young people. I've seen it in, over my career that there's been Walt Disney characters um, um, different rock groups and things like that. And that tells us a lot of things, that we've got a bunch of people that are gearing these things to a younger market. They're not gearing it to us, um, mm -hmm. although I like the Disney characters, but it's because of my, my children. And um, so you're, they're trying to market a product, and it's like packaging. Uh, we go to the store, we see something a, lo a lot of times, we, we're attracted because of the packaging. LSD trafficking patterns are no different. They package the product to appeal to the consumer market. 
Um, so that's about the only thing you can really look for. Um, what about crack cocaine? Cocaine, crack cocaine, um, you're going you're gonna to need a pipe. It's, it's ingested by smoking and it's typically a glass pipe or a ceramic pipe and the pipe will have a very fine white to an off-white powdery residue lining the pipe itself. Um, to look at the pipe you'd say, you know, is it talcum powder? Um, what could it possibly be? And I guess the thing to ask yourself as a parent is what what legal reasonable use would this pipe have? If you can't come up with one, then delve further and ask. Um, and along with cocaine, um, with cocaine hydrochloride, the powder form of cocaine, you're going to see things like mirrors, razor blades, um, tubes, straws that are cut maybe in half, and by straws I mean a drinking straw, and people use that as a um, just a tube to suck the cocaine up into the nose. Um, you'll see things like, and it leaves a white powdery residue behind. So, and those are things to look for. Um, marijuana use, you're going to find pipes, maybe you ha um, cigarette papers, um, roach clips, things along those lines, maybe um, um, marijuana residue in, in boxes, and, and, and just things that j just are not consistent with normal use of really anything else. And I guess, and, and to a large degree, especially with marijuana and any, any of the uh, substances that we see that are smoked, the imagination can just go haywire. And I guess the best advice is if it, if it doesn't look normal, or it's something that you at least want to ask a question, then ask the question. And um, I'll be more than happy to field anybody's phone calls at my office, even if they don't want to leave a name. Um, if they have a question on, hey, gee, I found this in my son's backpack. Um, what do you think it might be? And I've had parents call and ask, and they say, well, it's really nothing that I can think of related to drug abuse. And you can almost see the sigh of relief on the end of the, uh, other end of the line, or the opposite side and say, well, it sounds like a marijuana pipe to me, or something along those lines. Wayne, can we stop here? Because sure. some of our viewers may have a pen, and they may want to uh, put down your telephone number. And I would say to viewers who are outside the, of our area that it be area code 208, and if you would uh, give them that number, sure. that could be helpful. It's 769-1433, and that rings into the Department of Law Enforcement's office. And I said, if anybody has any questions that I can answer, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. I'm going to repeat that one more time. It's area code 208-769-1433. Thank you very much. Steve Sheen. Wayne, I want to get back to something you mentioned a minute ago about yeah. uh, the uh, marketing of drugs, and I guess this is a very much a business, a billion-dollar mm -hmm. business in this country. You can't uh, sell drugs at the corner grocery store. No. What what are drug dealers doing? H how are they going about systematically uh, uh, targeting young people or other markets that seem to have potential to them in selling their products? Well, they'll start out a lot like any other business person, and this is, uh, I guess, to put it as a perfect or a good example is the way crack cocaine got started um, in California and as it's proliferated throughout the United States. Many dealers actually gave the drugs away for free. And we don't see this happening an awful lot with any of the other drugs. In fact, rarely have I seen anybody give cocaine, hydrochloride away, LSD, marijuana, methamphetamine, or any of those drugs. But with crack cocaine, it was a new drug, um, competition from other drugs on the market. Um, there's a need to really get this product out there. And obviously, you're not going to go on TV and you know, give a phone number and you know, my drugs are better than so-and-so's. So you, there's marketing gimmicks or techniques, and part of it was to give the drug away. Does a couple of things. Give somebody a free taste. Maybe gets them uh, hooked into the idea that they really like it, so maybe they come back for another free sample or they just charge a few dollars. Unfortunately, by the time um, they realize that maybe they're in a little bit too deep, they have to have the drug. And I'm not saying not everybody that uses crack cocaine becomes addicted. That's not the case. But even if you have one person become addicted to it because of somebody giving it away free, that's one person too many that was tempted to do something that maybe they wouldn't have done if um, the price were exorbitant or um, just beyond their means. I, I really don't know. It's hard to look into the minds of why people um, choose to do drugs to begin with. Um, I mean, we could probably spend hours just mm -hmm. talking about, you know, escaping from problems or coping with stress or whatever, or just to feel good. Unfortunately, in, in my experience, the long-term drug user, for the most part, gets beyond the feeling good with a drug. They just don't want to get sick anymore. 
Um, they do the drugs because they need to maintain, especially with the harder drugs like cocaine addiction and methamphetamine. They're just trying to maintain. I do want to uh, get to a question about, about gangs in just a second, but you mentioned cost, and I think that's something we ought to explore a little bit. A, a, a full-blown addict, what does it cost to support a heroin uh, habit or a cocaine habit or a methamphetamine okay, um, habit? We don't see a whole lot of heroin in this area simply because of the cost. So, um, but cocaine, obviously, and methamphetamine, uh, very strong addictions. And boy, I would say it would not be unusual for someone to spend upwards of $100 per day if they have a fairly uh, strong addiction to a drug. Um, and certainly um, uh, several hundred dollars a week if somebody's just starting out or uh, mildly addicted or I hate to use the word mi mildly but um, has not quite a severe problem and when you start looking and adding things that say even a hundred dollars away you talk talking seven hundred dollars a week you add in uh, your cost of housing and food and it doesn't leave a whole lot if you're a working person and so then I think you, you can quickly see where we have the tie to violent crime and property crime um, with drug trafficking, drug abuse, um, it's hard for somebody that has a fairly substantial drug habit to pay for their habit through legitimate means, through working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's where we have the thefts, the burglaries, and, and robberies and things like that occur. Which gets me back to my question about gangs. How closely is gang activity and drug activity related? In some areas of this country, very much close hand in hand. Um, so far, and knock on wood, we have not seen a tremendous amount of problems in my jurisdiction, and hopefully, again, with city, county, law, and state law enforcement doing what we're doing, we won't. Uh, but there's other areas of our country uh, in not that far from this area. Uh, Spokane, for example, has a fairly strong gang problem, but Spokane police and the county are doing a tremendous job of curbing the problem. I think it would be a heck of a lot worse if it were not for the aggressive law enforcement stance they've taken there. Um, whether or not we see that over here, I really don't know, but th they are tied very much closely together because of the profit margin. It's a very quick and efficient way for them to make money. We have one minute left. Uh, what is the situation between the United States and Canada that we're so close to about traffic across the border? Um, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of uh, drugs going into Canada um, simply because just like with a, a lot of other goods, legal goods, um, things cost more in Canada and again it's just another way of extending the profit margin. What costs a little bit less here, if somebody can get into Canada they can make a little bit more. On that note we have to bring the permanent conclusion. Wayne on behalf of the panel and our staff we thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. You've been uh, most articulate and informative about a serious problem in society and we thank you. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Wayne Longo, who is with the Department of Law Enforcement in District 1, uh, a Bureau of Narcotics in Idaho. Uh, we know you have found this program to be informative, and we'd like to invite you to be with us again next week uh, at this very same time when we will discuss yet another important issue uh, and hope you, that you will tune in at that time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.